Today is December 1st, 2021. We're at the UNI Museum on the UNI campus. My name is Benjamin Kimball with the UNI Museum, and I'll be interviewing Brennan Hamilton. Thank you, Brennan, for interviewing with us. Please state your name, your role in your country school, and what years you attended school. Okay, so my name is Brennan Hamilton, and I was a student at Jefferson Elementary School, and then when it consolidated, I went to Lincoln Intermediate School, and Lincoln Intermediate School was just for fifth and sixth graders. And after fifth grade, then I went to Newman Catholic Middle School and then Newman Catholic High School. And the years that I went to school would have been, so I graduated in 2018, and I believe I would have started kindergarten the fall of 2005, so 2005 to 2018. Yeah. Describe your childhood. So growing up, I grew up in Mason City, Iowa, and I lived on a pretty busy street, and so every year we would celebrate the Music Man, and we would have this really big, awesome parade. And my house was right on the parade route, so it was really fun to always see that go by. And the Music Man was a really big part of actually my childhood because our town was based on the Music Man. And so every year from starting in kindergarten all the way up through I think about fifth grade, we would watch the Music Man in music class. And so it was really interesting. Um, growing up, I had two siblings, a sister named Jess, who was uh, three years younger than me, and then a brother named Noah who was about like four or five years younger than me. It was one of those, um, depending on the time of year, he was about four or five so years younger, so yeah. And of course I had my two parents, Brent and Katrina, um, and my mom was a teacher, well now she's a teacher for fourth grade, but at the time growing up she was a Christian ed director part-time at the church. And my entire childhood, my dad has worked for North Iowa Area Community College. He has been a math teacher and an ethics teacher, and he's become a deacon in the United Methodist Church, and he's now a pastor in the United Methodist Church. And he works at Geneva United Methodist Church. What were your interests as a child? So as a kid, I always really loved reading and history. Um, one of the things that I always joke about was that me and my friends would always play a lot of games based on like historical fiction and one of our favorite games was to play Titanic at recess um, and so we would always pretend to be like uh, the poor people you know and we never typically would ever get hit by the iceberg it'd usually just be us living on the ship um, so I always thought history was really interesting and like I said reading when I was a kid I was a part of uh, the talented in development reading um, so I always really enjoyed being able to leave classes sometimes and go to reading and just looking at different books and, you know, all of that. I also just really like talking in general, so that was always fun. Did you like school? Why? I did like school. I was a big, huge nerd. I always looked forward to it and I just, I don't know, especially back to school, time I just really loved going to get new backpacks and pencils and pens and I was a kid who always liked to bring cold lunch to school so I was like getting a new lunch box and it was just a really fun atmosphere and I had a lot of friends too so that helped to make me want to go to school is to hang out with my friends. What role did school play in your upbringing? School was a huge role. My mom always jokes with me that um, I, on the second week of kindergarten or one of the, within the first month, I went to her and I said, you know mom, I've learned it all. I'm good. I don't need to go to school anymore. I am set for life because, you know, I was pretty sure I knew everything at that point. And my mom looked at me and she said, listen, Brenna, you got to go to school until you get your master's degree. Like you can, once you get your master's degree, then you can quit school. But up until then, you got to just keep going to school. And so now I'm in my second year of getting my master's degree, so I guess, you know, she was right. Okay. Did school influence you as a child? I would say it did, yes, because I just, like I said, I always enjoyed learning and having two teacher parents 
they were always there for me to help me with if I needed help with like, math problems I could always go to my dad or if I needed help with like history or reading my mom was always there to help me like go through my papers and stuff like that so it was always really a very supportive environment Right. <clears throat> Where and when did you attend country school? So, I, like I said, I attended Jefferson Elementary School from, from 2005 to, I believe, 2010, I want to say. That was the end of fourth grade. So, from kindergarten to fourth grade, I was at Jefferson. And then in fourth grade, that's when they switched it to be Lincoln Intermediate because up until then, the way that the school system worked in public school at um, in the school system in Mason City, Iowa, was that there were four elementary schools, Jefferson Elementary, Roosevelt Elementary, Hoover Elementary, and Harding Elementary. And then when you got to middle school, they would break you off to be John Adams Middle School, which was, I believe, Jefferson and Harding, and then Roosevelt Middle School, which was Roosevelt and Hoover, I want to say. But then once you got into the high school, then all four would go together. But then when they consolidated it, it was, you know, the, still the four elementary schools, but then once you got to Lincoln, which was like fifth and sixth grade, then that was when all of the four elementary schools came together, um, rather than having it just be from four to two, then to one. And they said that they did that to try and um, make a better connection and make everyone feel more united as like Mason City, rather than people identifying by what middle school or what elementary school they went to. What is your earliest memory of country school? So my earliest memory of school probably would be of recess, my kindergarten year, because at recess, we before we could start, they had us all sit down and they had to talk to us about like the rules of recess and at Jefferson, at least, there were certain places that um, you had to be older to play on certain parts of the playground, like some of the monkey bars. They're like, okay, these monkey bars are only for, you know, the upper grades because they're kind of dangerous and you're kind of small, so we don't want you to fall off and like break an arm. And they also had different rules, like they taught us about like if it was blacktop only recess, that meant it was really rainy or really snowy, so they wanted us to just be on the blacktop, like where there was concrete, and not be out where there was um, a big, we had this big grassy field. And so that was like blacktop only recess. And then they talked about how like, you know, there was obviously rules of like, oh, you can't walk up right on the ice. Like if you want to play on the ice, you have to like kind of uh, crawl across the ice. And you know, just like things about sharing and different kind of rules like that. Like, oh, you can't walk up the slides, you know, you have to, be careful when you're on the swings, that sort of thing. What did, a, what did a typical morning before school look like? So before school, if we're talking elementary school, every morning I would wake up by my mom coming and waking me up. And she did this in middle school too, but once I got to high school, that's when we had to set our own alarms. But through elementary and middle school, my mom would always wake us up. And then we would go downstairs and we'd eat breakfast brush your teeth, get dressed for the day. When I was at public school, typically I would have the option of what I wanted to wear, you know, like as long as there wasn't any ripped jeans, because that was kind of like a big rule, is like no ripped jeans. But you could wear whatever jeans you wanted, and then like usually my mom would tell me like, oh, the weather is supposed to be this way, so you can have a choice of what t-shirt you want to grab and what shorts, or like, it's like jeans and a sweatshirt sort of weather. And so then I would know what clothes to grab being a little kid, you know, but when I was in middle school, once I got into uh, the Catholic school, then I just wore a uniform, and so then my mom would kind of tease me and be like, oh, are you going to wear red, or, or not red, that wasn't my color, but like, oh, are you going to wear white, or navy, or maroon today, ooh, what's it going to be, and because we didn't really have a lot of choices when we had a uniform. What was expected of you at home? So at home, my expectations typically were, uh, at least in like elementary school and going a little bit into middle school, but kind of dropped it off then, 
was we had a chore chart and we would earn, I think you could earn up to like $5 a week based on the chores you did because like the chores were always like, oh, you get 10 cents every day for brushing your teeth and you get like 10 cents for um, making your bed and like picking out your clothes was another like 10 cents. Like some of them changed as you got older depending on what you were in. So like for me, I did piano lessons starting in third grade and I did it all the way through eighth grade. So like when I was younger, that was a part of my chores was, oh, 30 minutes practice your piano. And then when I was in band, then it was another 30 minutes practice the trombone, and, you know. So that was like pretty typical, you know, kid stuff. And then usually on the weekends, that's when we would do like our big cleaning time. So usually I'd have to clean my bedroom. That was typically my main chore and then also like depending on the weather sometimes we'd have to go outside and help my dad like one of the big things he used to do was always tell us like we were in competition to pick up sticks which um was really funny because at the time we always thought it was a big like i don't know like a challenge like having all three of us out there picking up sticks being like oh who can pick up the most sticks but then when we got older we were like oh you're just doing that because you don't want us to you don't want to pick up the sticks so now you know just using us to pick up the sticks but yeah what time did you leave for school so typically in the mornings we would leave for school i'd say about like 7 30 or so because my elementary school was pretty close by and school started around eight and when i left for school typically in elementary school and up to like about fifth grade we did a carpool and we did a carpool with my neighbors the Detmers and they had kids who were about like so Lauren Detmer she was like my best friend in elementary school and so she was my age obviously and then she had a younger brother who was in between the ages of like me and my sister so he was like two years younger than me his name is Adam and then Miriam her younger sister was in the same grade as my younger brother Noah and so we played a lot with the Detmers. Like typically in the mornings, like a lot of times, like if my mom drove, then in the afternoons then her mom picked us up and then we'd play at the Detmers house until like five till supper or so and then we'd cross the street. Or typically it would depend on our age because if we were younger we couldn't cross the street alone because like the street we lived on was really, really busy. But once we got to be like in upper elementary school, then we like learned how to cross the street by ourselves. But yeah, so usually I'd go over to Lauren's or Lauren would come over to my house and it was pretty fun. How long did it usually take to get there? Um, so like for elementary school, it was maybe like a five minute drive or something. Sometimes if it was really, really nice out, we could bike ride there. Um, I remember when we would go to school um there was a coffee shop right across from my elementary school that parents would usually park at and the crosswalk guy mr miller was his name he would walk us across the street because that also was a pretty busy street and you know they didn't want like the kindergartners walking off by themselves into the busy road and i actually found this out recently but apparently me and my friends were almost hit by a semi truck when we were walking uh, I didn't really even know this to happen, but I was looking through like my keepsake box and I found uh, like this file and it was like a lawsuit and yeah, apparently me and my friends, I don't remember it, but yeah, they, the truck like, there was like a little a diagram of it and the truck was like coming and like blasted through the red light and me and my friends were like right there. <laughs> so yeah, that was kind of funny, I guess. I don't remember it, but probably funny. Were there ever any troubles besides that in getting to school? Not typically. I mean, I know there was one time it was really snowy out. This was in high school and it was really, really bad weather. And we had, so when you're a senior in high school, you would take English classes at NIAC instead of at your high school typically. And so I remember like everyone was making it out to NIAC because nothing had canceled yet because it was like an early morning, like 730 class. And I was just about ready to go when they canceled it. But apparently, because since my high school was really, really small, like 32 kids, we had a Snapchat with everyone in it, like a group chat. And this one boy told us all how he got like stuck in the ditch. But thankfully, 
his dad, he got stuck in the ditch, but it was like really close to his house, so his dad was able to get him out. And then also too, when I was in high school, it was kind of funny. My dad didn't think it was very funny, but I got, um, I had parked my car and it, so one of the wheels had gotten a little bit into the grass, you know? And overnight, the, some of the snow had melted, but then it refroze around my wheel. And I was gonna be late to mass. And the principal was pretty strict about if you were on a NIAC class, you couldn't be late to mass. You had to be there on time. And all of my friends had already gone to school and I was already running late, but my car was stuck. I could not move it. I was like slamming on the gas and everything. So my dad had to come home between classes and he had to like push my car out. And he was very upset about that because he got really, really muddy too, because it was like in April, I want to say. So yeah, that was kind of a struggle bus to get to school. And then also too, Mason City has a ton of trains. So a lot of times you would want to leave before trains were going because otherwise you could be stuck there for like an hour. It was really miserable. So yeah. So you mentioned attention, attending a Catholic school. Yes. So were you a Christian, a Protestant, or Catholic? So I was a Protestant and at my school there was about a third of the class was Protestant. Um, so that was about the ratio. I, I don't know, it was a pretty, pretty chill time. Why did you decide to attend a Catholic school? So, I decided to attend because my mom got a job there, partially, and then also partially I was pretty miserable after the consolidation happened. And so I just really wanted to be at a place, A, where I could make friends and be where I felt safe. And so, yeah, so that's why I switched over. Did your school have none? Uh, we did not, well, I take that back. Technically we had one, but she was in the elementary school and she retired like right after I got there. So I wouldn't have really interacted with her either. Her name was Sister Joan. And everyone always talked about how they really liked her, but that she was pretty strict. Um, and I know that Newman did have nuns back in the day, but I never had any of them. So were Protestants or non-Catholics treated differently from Catholics? Uh, for the most part, no. I mean, I never really experienced that. If anything, I would have teachers treating me nicer because they wanted to show that, like, Catholics were nice and, like, not, like, those stereotypes, you know, of being, like, a mean person or anything. And so I had, like, some really great religion teachers that honestly almost convinced me to become Catholic, but I decided against it. But, yeah, like, my element or not elementary, my middle school, religion teacher Sue Bragger she was just phenomenal I loved her classes she was just such a kind woman just awesome and so was um, Mrs. oh I'm forgetting her name but she taught freshman year religion and she was just a really awesome teacher too. So what was religion class like? So religion was pretty chill um, so a lot of times in religion we would mostly talk about um, when we talked about like Bible religion, I was pretty awesome at that because being a Protestant and just growing up having my parents really teach me in the church, it was really easy for me to get pretty good grades because I knew a lot of the questions. Um, but when they would focus more on like the Catholic tradition, that's where I would start to struggle because um, a lot of it was like I just didn't know some of the, like maybe the prayers or maybe I didn't know some of the abstract things about like oh I don't know exactly how the mass is run because I only go to mass like twice a month at school you know so it's not as much as say some of the kids who go every single week to mass plus mass at school so. So what was mass in school like? So my first year my sixth grade year we had mass every Wednesday at ninth hour so it was instead of a study hall basically you would go to mass and um, it was usually in the chapel because in between the middle school and high school there was a chapel and they could put usually all the middle schoolers in there. Um, all school masses were always in the gym because they couldn't fit all the kids in there. And usually they were pretty fine, although there would be a couple during the like beginning of the school year when it was really, really hot. And I remember that kids would pass out during it, so they would have to like pull those kids out or like it'd get really hot and especially if you were wearing like a sweatshirt you'd be pulling it up as much as you could um, most people once I got into high school 
when they wore their sweatshirts, they didn't wear like a Newman shirt underneath so they couldn't take it off because otherwise they'd get dress coded. So that's why they'd always roll up their sleeves. But yeah. And then, oh, and then after sixth grade, that's when it went to about twice a month with once a month being all school and then the other time a month being just for like the middle school or just for the high school. And usually the high school masses were always in the gym as well. It was just middle school that typically just went to the um, went to the chapel. And then also during Advent season, it was always really fun because um, on the Mondays that like right after the Sunday, you know, Monday morning, they would gather us all together and we'd like light the Advent wreath and then do like a quick little like prayer service, and it was really fun. Got to, kind of got you in the Christmas spirit. Did you have any holy days off that the local public schools did not? Um, sometimes we would get um, Good Friday off, although with busing, when we started to share busing, that changed because we had to kind of copy what the, um, what the public schools were doing as well. So were there any differences really between the Catholic school schedule and the public school schedule? Um, not a ton actually, like I said, because of busing, we had to pretty much kind of work together with that. I think they had different class periods because of course they didn't have like a religion class, so I think that their schedule was only eight periods a day instead of nine periods a day, but I'm not 100% on that because I only kind of knew what my public school friends told me, so, but that's what I sort of gathered. Was there a division or rivalry between the students of the Catholic schools and those of the public schools? Yes, specifically with baseball. So baseball at Newman and baseball in Mason City in general is a huge thing. Like I would argue baseball is bigger than football there. Like everyone is obsessed with baseball. And so during the summer, they would always have the big Mason City versus Newman baseball game. And it was always really interesting because Newman was a really, really small school. Like I said, like I graduated with 32 kids in my class. So we were like a 1A school and the public school was like a 4A school or a 5A, sometimes they'd go in between. And we would always beat them, the, the Catholic school would. And the pro, not the presses, the, the public school would always accuse the Catholic school of like recruiting or spending money to try and like snipe players or buy out players from like other countries or other places, which is ridiculous because like Newman did not have the money to do that and they definitely did not do that like none of the players were purchased and none of the players were like secretly from other countries that they had brought over to be really good or anything that was always the big the scandal that they always tried to perpetuate but it was totally false. Was your school accredited by the state? Yes my school was. There was another Christian school in town called the North of Iowa Christian School like also call them Knicks, and they were not accredited. They had very, very, very small um, classes. I think the largest class they had was seven kids. I was friends with some of the kids from the Christian school, and I know that they had told me that one of their biology books was from the 1950s because it said that evolution was fake in it, and they said that that was kind of interesting to be reading, you know, in 2016 or whenever um, my friend told me that. So going back to your time in the country school, mm -hmm. describe your schoolhouse and the layout of the classroom. Please describe the interior and exterior of the building. Okay, so at Jefferson, the school was more or less like it was one story, and when we would go in, I always loved it because on the outside of the school, they had these like pencil pillars that, like they were just pillars, but they had been decorated to look like pencils, so I just thought they were really cool that lined the walkway into the main entrance and um, I remember when yeah, I was like a little kid a lot of times that's where the younger kids would get picked up and you'd always stand in they always talked about like this they had this painted yellow square outside and they called it like the magic square that you would like stand in if your car was up next to be picked up um, but that also then became where the bus kids were picked up so then they had a couple of other exits out um, on the side, like I said, there was a coffee shop across the other side, so a lot of times, like, I personally would go out those doors, 
but then sometimes I would go out the doors towards like the playground side and um, I had a lot of friends that lived in the neighborhoods across from the playground so sometimes too if I was going over to their houses then I would go outside the playground side as well. What technology did your school have access to? Oh yeah so the technology was pretty typical of the time there was um, Obviously, like we had TVs, we had um, eventually we got smart boards. Um, we had a bunch of different, you know, like eventually into high, like middle school, high school. That's when they got iPads and like Chromebooks and all of that. But starting out, I remember the teachers like in, in elementary school, they would still use like projector, like the projectors that you'd wheel in on a cart, not like the overhead projectors that they got in like fifth grade, I think is when they got the actual overhead projectors, but from K4, they only had like the wheel in ones where you'd put like a clear piece of paper on and you could write it, write your answer on it, and then like it would reflect onto the, um, onto the like blackboard or whiteboard or whatever. Because some of the um, classrooms in my elementary school actually did just have chalkboards, they were not. Um, whiteboards until like later I want to say and also I just realized I did not talk about my other two schools so Lincoln was a two-story um, building and it was pretty like just like a square more or less and when you went into it um, most people in the mornings you know you'd wait inside the um, like the kitchen area or the not the kitchen like the cafeteria the cafeteria kind of doubled as like a waiting area and then you would go over to your lockers and the, depending on which grade you were in, most of the fifth graders were on the first floor and most of the sixth graders were on the second floor, but there was a little bit of overlap. Like I personally, as a fifth grader, was on the second floor just because they ran out of lockers for us. And all of these lockers, these were the only lockers I ever had that had combinations. And so that was a real pain for me to try and remember. I believe my code was 474, but I'm not 100% on that. But I do remember that my locker was right next to some really smelly boys. One was just like, and the main issue was that they both liked Axe products, and but they liked two different Axe products. And so every single morning, I would smell two competing colognes. And it was not a fun time because yeah, it was just like, Oh boy, it smells like a, you know, like an axe bomb is what they would call it back in the day. Um, which was basically when, or an axe shower, when a guy would put on way too much cologne instead of like not doing that. Um, and then in, at uh, Newman, they, it was more of like kind of, it was like a box, but it was single story, but there was kind of like a center of it where it was like in the center there was like this little garden that was inside of the outer box but no one could actually go into the little garden um, but you could see it sometimes when you'd like be in classrooms and things and then inside of this like box area right this part like the bottom part was the middle school and so there was like two teachers rooms and like that and then there's like lockers and then on the other side it was like the high school and then Beyond that, like there was the gym and all that, and we had two gyms. We had a uh, South Gym and the regular gym. And the big rumor, the big uh, kind of myth about Newman was that in the South Gym, this is this is a rumor, was that the South Gym back in the 50s when it opened was originally a pool, but that then one day a girl was swimming in the pool and they didn't see her in there, and so they closed up the um the tarp over her and then she drowned and died and that after that happened they had to close up the pool and they cemented it down and then they put a bunch of um the gym hardwood floor over it and no one ever talked about it but that because she died she still stayed at newman and that her ghost haunted this specific set of lockers that the teachers would never let you touch or get into which later I realized that's where they kept their teacher supplies was in those lockers so that's why they didn't want you to touch and get into them because like that's where they had all their spare markers and whatever but of course as a kid you're like oh, there's a ghost but Newman never had a pool none of that was real but there were people who swore they saw the ghost and that 
you know, late at night after practice, the ghost would like appear to them and they would be freaked out. So yeah, that was their big rumor, but it was not true. Um, and then the elementary school was also connected to the middle school and the elementary school was just like pretty basic. The one of the elementary school rooms was a middle school room, so that was where I had homeroom my sixth grade year was actually technically in the elementary. And it was really nice because the elementary had heating and air conditioning, whereas the rest of the school did not. And so it would get pretty hot or pretty cold depending on the time of year. Um, they did have a furnace system um, at, Je uh, not Jefferson, at Newman, um, but they never actually like, it wasn't like centralized, you know? And I remember one time the furnace broke in my religion teacher's class and it got really, really, really like stinky in there because like black smoke was coming out. And so everyone had to leave the room and then she had to, she was teaching religion out in the hallway and I was in um, social studies and I remember seeing it all go down, like looking out the side of the room because her classroom was right across from it and the smell just wafting in, it was so gross. But yeah, so that was, that was one of the things that was kind of crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was the layout. And like I said, at the public school too, most of the computers were very much um, like PC computers, you know, and we would have like headphones, stuff like that um, at a computer lab. But then at Newman, they had more like Apple technology. Newman was a lot more into Apple technology. so we would have like the old Apple computers, like the ones that look like big boxes, you know? So those were kind of interesting to have, but then they upgraded them to be actually like Macs and it was pretty nice, but yeah. When you arrived at your country school, how did your school day typically begin? So depending on the day, um, like depending on the grade and stuff, that would kind of differ. Typically, you know, you go to class, we would say the Pledge of Allegiance, um, although that stopped really once we were in fifth grade. Like they did that more for like the elementary schoolers because elementary schoolers thought it was fun. Um, I never actually knew how to say the Pledge of Allegiance correctly because you know as a little kid you don't always know the right words and so instead of saying indivisible I said indivincible all the time because I didn't know what the word was. Um, so yeah so we do that and then at Jefferson on Fridays, they would usually have the fifth graders do this like newscast and they would turn on the TV and it would always start with the uh, the one song, you know, like A, B, C, it's simple as one, two, three, it's easy as do, re, me, A, B, C, one, two, three, baby, you and me. And then it would like cut to the like fifth graders little newscast. And I always thought that was really fun and I always wanted to be a part of the news team, but then once the consolidation happened, then they stopped doing that. So it was kind of sad because, like I said, I always thought it was really fun. And like sometimes they'd go around and interview people. So if you were chosen, you'd get to be interviewed. Um, and then they do like the morning announcements and usually say if anyone had a birthday and if there was anything special, like, oh, we're doing, uh, you know, like hearing tests or we're doing um, some sort of event in the gym. Usually that's what they would do. Um, but yeah, so that was usually what they did. And then also same with, um, in middle school and in high school, like usually they would just say the morning announcements and at, and in the Catholic school, we would always pray to start off the day. And sometimes it would be over the announcements, but sometimes like the teachers would just do the prayer. It kind of depend. And then at the end of the day too, for the Catholic school, they would always say this one prayer and then they'd also read out, um, so Newman Catholic was based off of Cardinal Newman who is now a saint. At the time he was not a saint, he was just blessed. So we'd always talk about whether or not he was going to become a saint. But they would always say um, this benediction I believe that he wrote. I do not remember it, but he would, we would always say that at the end of the school day. What did students usually do when they arrived at school? So, if it was in elementary school, if you arrived early, usually you'd throw your backpack in your locker and you would go outside and play until um, it was time to come back in, you know. If it was cold out, you'd usually just stay in the classroom and talk because, you know, you couldn't really do much else. 
but then when you were in fifth grade like i said you usually go to the cafeteria and you just chat with your friends go find some people um and then in high school and middle school sort of the same thing like people would just meet up in the cafeteria to chat although when i was in middle school and high school my mom you know worked at the school and so usually i just stay in her classroom and help her out if she needed to like you know cutting out different little things for the day or like sticking things on the students um, like lockers or on their desks or passing out papers, that sort of thing is what I tip it, I personally typically did. How many students were in your classes, both in your country school and at the Catholic school? Yeah, so at Jefferson, <clears throat> the average class size was about 75 kids, so there was like three little sections typically growing up all the way through. At Lincoln, that's where there was obviously all three or all four schools came together so that was I believe about like 400 kids and then when I went to the Catholic school my graduating class was like I said about like I think 32 or 34 something like that there was no 34 because there were 17 girls and 17 boys how do you remember your classmates so I remember them all being very kind to me there really wasn't a ton of issues that I had with like bullying or anything um, everyone for the most part was pretty kind. I mean, you know, you'd have like maybe some snarky people every once in a while, but that was sort of just life, you know. Um, I remember, um, I don't know, just like a lot, it was very much like a family vibe, I would say, where just like with your family, sometimes you get annoyed at them, but they're still your family, so you're not gonna like do anything really mean to them because, you know, it's like your sibling, you know, which I always thought was funny because like, Especially at Newman, you know, we'd always say the Newman family, and it was always so true because you always just felt like everyone there was your sibling, and it was always funny because like hardly anyone ever dated from like Newman kids hardly ever dated each other like in my grade. It was always just weird, like oh, why would I want to date that guy? I remember him way back when, like being gross, you know. That's ooh. so like a lot of times if you were gonna date someone, especially in high school, you would outsource to other schools because everyone else just felt like they were like your brother or your sister or something so it's just like oh why would i want to be with them um but yeah it was very much like a family and which i appreciated how would your classmates remember you i think they remember me as being like really shy and quiet um when i was in middle school and also in high school i was very 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 um self-conscious uh, it was to the point where, I am not even kidding you, I would have literally rather stabbed myself in the hand and written in my own blood than turned to one of the kids in my class and asked them, hey, can I borrow a pen? Because I was just always very, very worried about how people would perceive me, how people would see me as a person, you know, I was just always very nervous about that. And the interesting thing, though, is, is that I actually told some people that later on, and they all were like, what are you talking about? We all like you, what are you, you know? And I just was so worried about being hated or about how I was understood, but I didn't really need to be. So that was, that's sort of how I was. What lessons did you study in, at the country school and at high school? Yeah, so obviously we did all the basic ones like reading, writing, uh, language arts, which I'd always abbreviate as LA. Um, there was social studies, science, and math, and then once I got to Catholic school religion, but the rest, you know, were basically the same thing or some sort of variation off of that thing. Like, you know, in high school you take government and econ and some of those other more specified classes, but yeah. Did you have music education at your school? I did. I was actually a part of, in elementary school, as a part of a group called Jefferson Singers. And starting in like third grade, third to fifth grade typically is what it was. And you would go around and you'd get to sing to different people and you do caroling. And it was a really, really fun time. And at Jefferson, actually, we had a school song. And it was really fun. Um, it was like, when Jefferson kids walk down the street, they look 100% from head to feet. They got that smile, that smile, that winning way. No matter where you go, you'll recognize them and you'll say, Now there's a kid I'd like to know. They got that good old Jefferson pep and go. And then I don't remember the rest of it. But it was pretty fun. You know, I always liked, the part I always loved was the part where you go pep and go. 
Um, but we had a really great music teacher in kindergarten and in all of elementary school. Her name was Mrs. Hill. And we'd have like tons of different time where we'd do like piano, we'd do singing, we'd play with different instruments. It was just such a fun experience that it just really built up my love of music. And then of course, being in a town that loves Meredith Wilson and loves The Music Man, that just made music even cooler because there was never this like stigma of like, oh, only nerds do, you know, choir or something like everyone wanted to do choir or band. It was just seen as like the cool thing to do. And so I, um, when we did fourth, in fourth grade, we all did like testing for music. And I really wanted to be in the saxophone. I really wanted to be saxophone, but I got put in trombone, but I was okay with that. Like trombone was pretty fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and obviously like the song 76 trombones, I thought that was pretty cool to be right at the front of the parade and all that. Um, so yeah, music was very heavily prioritized at my, in my, uh, town. Did your school offer any physical education? Yes, we did. And for the longest time, I was really bad at PE. I remember um, one time in elementary school, my PE teacher, his name was Mr. Childress, but we all called him Cha-Cha. I don't remember why, but we did. And I remember he was kind of like, oh, like, uh, trying to like encourage me to do more or something and I was like well I'm trying my hardest and my mommy says that's always good enough and he was like well your mom's right that you're yep but I was just not athletic like I was always last or second to last in the mile run which we started in third grade and I remember a lot of my friends would like always joke like oh you're so slow you're the slow one you know and like I would joke about it too, like, oh yeah, I'm so slow, look at me, haha, -ha, I hate running, I hate this, but like, it always kind of hurt my feelings a little bit, when, especially like during like tag or something, everyone would always try to get me, because they were like, oh, you're the slow one, whatever, and I remember this one boy, his name was Jack Phillips, um, after I had been tagged, and I was really sad, because I was like, I know I can't get anyone, and he was like the fastest kid. He like walked up to me and he's like, here, you can get me, it's okay, I'll get them for you. And I was like, oh, thank you. And he was just a really sweet kid, so I really appreciated that. Um, but it wasn't until I had this really awesome PE teacher named Mr. Birch that I actually cared about PE. Um, because Mr. Birch, like one of the first things he did when you were there, your freshman year, is he sat you down and he was like, listen, I know not all of you are star and I get it. And he's like, but the thing is, is I'm going to look for effort. And he's like, I can tell when the non-athletic kids are putting their all in versus when the athletic kids are maybe giving 10%. And he said, yeah, the athletic kids giving 10% might look like a lot better than the, the non-athletic kids giving it their all. But he's like, but I can see the difference. I can tell. And so that's like really inspired me. And I started to actually start running more like regularly. And I remember I got my best mile time um, my senior year with him, and it was 9 minutes and 59 seconds because he said everyone's going to get under 10 minutes, and I did. And I was so proud of myself because um, conversely, when I was in the consolidated school, I had this gym teacher that I really, really didn't like because he only liked the athletic kids. And being a little, you know, maliciously compliant, uh, when he said, you know, you have to do the mile run, but do as long as you need to take, uh, me and my friends decided to walk the mile. And I, um, and I had heard, you know, that they don't base the mile run on how fast you run, but actually just your improvement from the fall to the spring. So in the fall, we walked 24 minutes. And in the spring, we walked 22 minutes because I was just not having it. And it was so funny because that teacher, he was screaming at us and yelling at us. And I just remember walking by and be like, mm, you can't touch me, you can't physically hit me, I don't care if you're yelling at me. Uh, student laws say you cannot be like doing anything actually to me and you can't give me a bad grade because technically I'm improving. So, haha. -ha. But yeah, and then in middle school, we had this teacher, her name was Miss Whitney. And she was a very strict but very good teacher. But she was like, she was a very much a feminist. Which is great, I agree that like, yeah, women should be in sports, but at the time I was like, not this woman, I do not want to be in sports. 
Um, and it was really hard because she would always get really mad at the boys for not passing to the girls, you know? And I was in a class with mostly boys. And I was like, no, that's okay, don't pass to me. Ignore me, I don't exist, I'm not here on this field. Everyone else play. And I remember um, she pulled out all the boys right away in class and she's like, since you guys aren't passing to the girls, I'm gonna only let the girls play in PE and you just have to watch them. And I was like, oh no, this is really bad. This is my worst nightmare because the only other girls, we played three on three basketball for a half hour. And the, all the other girls in that class were all basketball girls. And so they were just like killing it while I was like, this is my nightmare, I hate this. But I will say it was good that she was there to kind of encourage the girls and be like, no, like you're valid, you're just as important. Like your sports are just as important, just as good. It doesn't matter if you're a girl or boy. But as a girl who really didn't want to try, it was not fun for me because I just was like, you know, this is great, but not for me. I, I'm okay with the stereotype of women being bad at sports if it covers me up. But I think it was good because it did give me a little bit of a challenge. Did your school offer foreign language classes? Yes, it did. We had a Spanish class when I was in high school. And then when I was in elementary school, there was actually a woman who moved here um, from Mexico. Her name was Mari, and she was my Spanish teacher from, I think, like, first grade to third grade or so. I don't exactly remember how long, because she did eventually move. And I'm friends with her on Facebook, and she's doing work pretty well. Um, but yeah, so I learned Spanish originally from her. And then my friend's um, mom taught Spanish up in the high school, so she kind of like took over for a little bit, but like not really. And then when I was actually in high school, then I took Spanish from um, at the Catholic school, and it was really good. Yeah, I was always pretty good at Spanish too. So I um, I remember one time there was a substitute in the class, and he's like, "Oh, who's the best kid in the class?" and Everyone just pointed directly at me, and I was pretty proud of that moment, but, yeah. <laughs> did your school offer art classes? They did. Um, it was mandatory up through fifth grade, and then, actually no, sixth grade. And then after sixth grade, um, they then allowed you to pick which specials you wanted, although in middle school you had to pick at least one special, and then once you were in high school, I think you had to have one like art, whether it was choir, band, or actually art. Um, and when I was in um, elementary school, I liked art, but the art teacher didn't like me. And it was really hard for me because I would do artistic things and I would, you know, like draw my pictures and stuff. And I remember she like pulled me aside and she literally would like rip up my paintings or rip up my drawings and tell me I was terrible and she'd just tell me like I'm just gonna do it for you because you're so bad at this and she'd do that for literally every project so while a lot of other kids would have art projects that they would keep I never had any because my mom was like because I, I told my mom what was happening and my mom was like well I'm not gonna keep these drawings that aren't drawings that you've done and so like my mom and dad would always encourage me to do drawings and stuff at home so then that way I wouldn't get kind of like attacked by this teacher a lot but she really made me hate art because like a lot of my other friends they were always like praised in her class and they were always like the good kids whereas I was always told like oh you're terrible you'll never do this you always draw so bad you know and just I just remember all the time seeing those papers get ripped right up in front of my eyes and I never cried in the class because I didn't want her to see me cry, you know, kind of be strong, but it hurt, you know, and yeah, and so yeah, I never really developed art because I kind of became a little bit of a snob and like anti-art and being like, oh well, like art's just for weirdos, whatever, because it just made me mad, you know, and it was just a way to deflect, but really it just made me sad because it's like, oh, I wanted to be good like my friends. and. And I remember, too, one of the things she told me, she's like, the only thing you're good at is drawing a straight line. That's all. That's all you could ever do. Which, in my head, I was like, I didn't say it, but, like, at the time, but, you know, like, when you're, you think about things later, I was kind of like, well, then, good, I'll become an architect and make a lot more money than you. But I didn't, 
you know, obviously say that because, you know, you're like seven or eight. You're not going to say that to a teacher, but you're going to think it in your head. Did your school offer special ed classes or gifted classes? We did. Um, so actually, the we had a special, we had different rooms for both special ed and also for um, the gifted room. And in the special ed class, they had a dog, and the dog's name uh, I don't remember the dog's name, but I do remember that the dog was there, and that was one of the first things they also had to teach us was not to pet the dog because the dog was like, um, like an emotional support dog, and like if the dog had the um, the gear on, you know, we weren't allowed to touch it because it was like at its work. Um, but it was a chocolate lab and we always liked petting it. Oh, it's name was Zeke. Zeke was the dog. And so we always liked it because like when Zeke was off duty, you could play with Zeke and pet Zeke and it was really fun. Um, and I remember they were talking about putting me in some sort of like special classes for um, writing numbers because I was really, really bad at that. Um, I would write them backwards. And I remember my mom, um, she then, while they were kind of talking about doing that, um, every night she would have me write numbers on like a notebook. Like if I was going to be watching a show or something, she would hand me a notebook and we'd just sit down and I'd just write specifically the number three and the number five over and over and over again into like the notebook. Like I'd fill up like pages of it until finally I'd get it right so then the teachers would kind of get off my back. So I did that, and then, um, like I said, I did TD reading from first grade to fourth grade, and I really, really loved that. Um, for the most part of it, it was just me and this other boy named Raroon, and Raroon was in both reading and math, but um, I was just in reading. And in reading, usually you just leave reading class, and you go, and our teacher, Mrs. Anderson, would usually have us read a separate book, or we'd do like kind of big projects, like. I remember I did a project on Helen Keller and I also did a project on um, Rosa Parks and I remember Raroon did his project on MLK and this was like when I got in trouble for talking in um, the hallway because me and Raroon were giggling because um, instead of saying the Supreme Court I said the sour cream court and so we were laughing really loudly about that in the hall and the teacher came out and yelled at us so yeah. <laughs> Did your school have a guidance counselor? We did. Um, her name was Mrs. Despinis. This was in um, elementary school. In middle school and in high school, you know, they, the guidance counselor's more just there for, like, oh, we'll be guiding you towards college, you know. But the guidance counselor in um, elementary school is more about, like, mental health. And Mrs. Despinis was really, really awesome. She would come in about once a month and teach you about, like, different things like I remember the like self-esteem talk and being told like that sometimes like there's certain like little monsters that come and try to eat away at your self-esteem but you need to fight them back you know and then also too I remember the talk of um the buckets and we were told that everyone has a bucket and that you want to fill their bucket by doing nice things but that if you have an empty bucket it won't help you to empty someone else's bucket that you need to just help others you know, and that, but that, that's why, like, bullies exist, because, like, bullies will try to empty your bucket too much, you know, to fill their own bucket, but really you need it, if someone's bullying you, then you need to know, like, oh, they just have an empty bucket, so I shouldn't be mean to them, because they have, you know, they have an empty bucket, um, and so she was really nice, and then also in fourth grade, I had a little bit of French drama, and so I would go and chat with her a lot, about that because I had two friends um, that I was really close to but both of them wanted to be my only best friend and they didn't like the other one and so they kind of fought over me and so we would have to go all three of us to the guidance counselor a lot because there was a lot of tears a lot of sad times um, fighting over who would be my actual best friend when I was just like why can't you both be my best friend I like you both but yeah did your school teach driver's ed or was that from a private company? So at the public school they did offer driver's ed, but the teacher who taught it, he was very questionable at times. Like people who took it um, would talk about how he would like fall asleep while you were driving and how he kind of like didn't really care. So I wanted to have a kind of better education also because I was kind of a bad driver. I'm a better driver now. 
but at the time I wasn't super great. So yeah, I went to a private company in Clear Lake and it was on top of, so like there was a car dealership, um, Lake Chevrolet, and so you'd go up to the top of the dealership and they had like this little room and you'd all sit there and do that. And I remember um, I had a friend, his name was Matt, who was always there and he and his sister and his sister's friend, we'd all sit at like a table together and I'd always bring like a family sized bag of Twizzlers and we'd sit there and eat our Twizzlers and usually like, drink coffee or something while the like driver's ed teacher would be sitting there being like, now we're gonna watch a video of people like getting smashed into by trains and like if you need to leave, you can leave, but this is gonna be really violent and we'd just be chomping away at our Twizzlers. Um, but it was always like a really fun time like doing the drives, although during driver's ed I did get pulled over <laughs> because my driver's ed teacher told me to go. We were on an um, intersection um, in a country road and he told me to go and I was like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. So I went, but the state trooper almost hit us. So the state trooper pulled us over and I was like so scared. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Here's my license. Of or my like you know my student permit you know like I'm so sorry uh, and like the driver is like well your teacher should have taught you better and literally like moments after the state trooper like walked like three feet away my driver's ed teacher was like sitting there sassing him being like oh well that guy was probably speeding you know like cops like to speed a lot and he was just probably mad because you had the right of way but he's just being a brat and I'm like please stop talking, please, I just don't want this state trooper to be mad at me, and the state trooper was fine, but he like kept kind of being snappy at the driver's ed teacher too, and I'm just like, please don't give me a ticket, please don't give me a ticket, but I didn't get one, it was fine, but it did scare me a lot. <laughs> did your school teach cursive? Yes, it did, and I was pretty good at cursive. Although I didn't like it, I thought that it was pretty boring and like tedious because we didn't really have to use it for anything besides signing our name. And like sometimes teachers would be like, oh, try to write in cursive. But I just didn't understand the point because it took me like 10 times as long to write in cursive as it did to write regularly. Um, and usually most teachers didn't require it because everyone's cursive was so terrible. Except for um, when I was in sixth grade, I had a teacher who always required it. But it was really funny because I had a friend who, when spelling tests would come around, um, she would purposely write like the A's and E's and I's really similar. So if she didn't know something, she could do that. And then the teacher would just be like, oh, did you mean an E here? And she'd be like, um, yeah, 100%, that's what I meant. And she'd get like straight A's. It was insane. I was very jealous of her talent of doing that. I could never pull it off. What were your teachers like? So my teachers, for the most part, they were all really chill and really nice. Um, I remember probably like the ones that really stand out would be my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Mejia, because she was just so fun and she made social studies and like learning history just so much fun for us. Um, she always had like fun little activities as we were learning the regions. We'd do like different little things. Like when we did like the Northeast, we did um, an assembly line. And I remember that because we assembled little Hershey's Kisses together. And then at the end, we'd get to eat them. And then also when we were in the Northeast, we did uh, like a walking thing where we pretended to walk up all the stairs of the, uh, what do you call it, of the Empire State Building. And so I thought that that was just a really fun class. And also, Mrs. Mejia had lived in the same house that I lived in. You know, like she had been the old the person that lived there before us. And so it was really fun. Um, and then I found out too that she had like the same bedroom as me, which I was like, I totally repainted it, but okay. But it was really fun just to know like, oh, my teacher used to live in my house and like my bedroom was her bedroom, you know? So I thought that was fun. And then in middle school, the middle school teacher stood out a lot more to me. Um, Mrs. Brager, she was awesome. Sue Brager, 10 out of 10. Like, she's the sort of person like, just, she was so nice and kind. But she also didn't take smack from people. Um, and so I really appreciated that. And also it was really cool because she always taught us about consent. Where like not a lot of other teachers would talk about that. But she was always very clear. Like no means no. And so she would talk about that. Because also, you know, she taught science and religion. So she would talk about that and how like we need to respect others and all this. So I just thought that was cool. 
Um, and then also in middle school we had a teacher, like I said, Miss Whitney, who was a PE teacher, but she also taught like 7th and 8th grade science. And I always um, was scared of her because she was just really intimidating. And on the first day of school, um, she kind of like rolled us into a full sense of security. She was all like, oh, how are you guys doing? How is, are you all worried about seventh grade? And we're like, no, we're not worried. And she literally slammed down her hand on the desk and yelled, well, you should be. And it was very scary. But she told us, um, in that speech, she told us, you should always be worried about the next step even if it seems small, because if you're not, then you're a fool. Because you should always be prepared for whatever comes next and always have a little bit of apprehension because otherwise you're coming in blind. But she always taught us like a lot of really good life lessons too. Like, she told us, you know, one day, she's like, listen, in life, there's always going to be someone better than you and there's always going to be someone worse than you. So you have three options here. You can be bitter that you're not up like the people that are better than you, or you can be pompous jerk because you're better than other people, but your third option here is to just be at peace and know that yeah, there's going to be someone better and there's going to be someone worse, but you don't need to be either bitter or being like too proud or pompous. Um, she also, um, even though she terrified me, she did teach science really, really well, and I always really respected her, um, and she almost made me cry too because... So when I was in like seventh grade, um, I was doing a lab report and I was partners with like one of my best friends at the time. And well, one of the first rules, let me tell you, one of the first rules of cheating is if you're going to cheat, you got to change the answers. And I love my best friend, but she did not know that rule. And she had, I don't know, she had like missed the assignment or something and it was like right before class started. She's like, can I see your assignment? And can you just share it with me? Because we were doing a lab report. And I was like, sure. And I was like, but I'm not answering the critical thinking questions. I'm just giving you the first part of the lab report where it's just the data. That, like, everyone would be the same, you know. I'm not going to give you the critical thinking. You have to answer the critical thinking questions on your own. Well, this girl did not know the whole change of answers around. Because, A, she did answer the critical thinking question. She just assumed I gave her the whole thing. I did not. And B, she didn't even change around our names on the assignment so that her name would be on the top. And so Miss Whitney, you know, pulled us aside and was like, you need to speak with us right now. And she got really mad at my friend. But then, like, for me, she pulled me out and she was like, I assumed she was going to yell at me because she always yelled at people if she pulled them out. But she told me, like, she's like, listen, Brenna, I get it. Like, you're the awkward nerd kid. And, like, you feel uncomfortable and, like, you want to make friends, but she's like, but you, it's not good to make friends because they, they want to cheat off of you. Because she's like, you're very intelligent, and you shouldn't you let people use your intelligence to say that they're friends. Because if they want to just use you, then they're not really your friend, you know? And I was like, yeah, I guess you're right. And she's like, yeah, like, don't just do things for people because you think that it'll make them like you. Like, you need to, people who are worth anything they'll like you because of who you are, not because of what you can do for them. So I really always liked her. And then in high school, Senora, the Spanish teacher, she was super awesome. I loved her. She was just really funny. And um, like I said too, Mrs. Nettleton, that was the religion teacher in ninth grade. She was so fun. And yeah, those are the ones that, oh, and Mrs. Nichols, she was an English teacher. And she also was pretty hard on us for like writing. But without her, I would not be in grad school right now, I can tell you that, because she made us write so many papers and we had to write them to her caliber. Like you would just, anytime you handed in a paper, just expect red marks back because you'd have to redo it. But she was making us be better writers and I know that if I didn't have her class, I would not be the writer or the person I am today. Yeah. Describe a typical school lunch time. So lunch was always really fun for me. I was always the cold lunch kid. So typically, because I was really picky, um, from kindergarten through fifth grade, I would always have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That was my favorite. Um, and usually I'd have a fruit like grapes or an apple or an orange, and then like a snack, like a piece of candy or something. Um, and But if it was like a regular lunch, then I would get that. But usually I'd just buy the milk, um, because like I said, I was pretty picky. 
Um, in elementary school, you just sat with whoever your class was, and you could try and like line up so that you'd be standing next to your buddies. But it wasn't you wouldn't always line up perfectly, you know. So like that was always sad boy hours. Um, in fifth grade, you kind of got to sit wherever you wanted because like the fifth graders just had a lunch. Um, at fifth grade at Lincoln during the consolidation, one of the things they tried to introduce was um, this ticket system of like if you did a good thing you get a ticket but the thing is is if you already were a good kid you didn't get tickets because they didn't want to they didn't feel like they had to reward you for doing the basic things so I never got tickets because you know the teacher wasn't going to give me a ticket for bringing my pencil in but he would bring give the tickets out to the kids who never brought their pencils and that sort of thing but I realized you know that a lot of my friends well the classmates that were around me, they oftentimes did not get like desserts a lot or like especially homemade desserts. And so I realized I could trade my desserts for tickets and then I could use those tickets to buy the things I really wanted, which were smelly highlighters. And I ended up getting over 75 tickets through uh, bribing people that way and like doing a little barter and trade. Um, I even got a teacher to do it too. I was like, oh, I don't really know if I'll want my cookie. Do you think you'll want it? And she's like, oh, sure, thanks, honey. And I'm like, can I have a ticket for it? And she's like, you know, you shouldn't bribe teachers. I'm like, I know, I'm sorry. And she's like, well, you're being good, so I'll give you two tickets. Thanks for the cookie. So, yeah, I did run a little bit of an underground system during lunch. And then in middle school too, I also... Um, would sell uh, little friendship bracelets. Me and my friends would make them. And we oversaturated the market though, and everyone, literally all, ev everyone, girls and boys, had friendship bracelets. And we even started trying to outreach into like friendship necklaces and friendship rings, but those didn't really take out too much. Um, but yeah, like sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, uh, you had to sit kind of like, so sixth graders were in the middle, seventh graders were off to one side, and eighth graders were off to the other side, but you could sit in those in those sections you know although I do remember sometimes if we were too loud they would introduce a seating chart at lunch and seating chart was always my birthday and in seventh grade I had to sit next to this boy who was really 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 gross and I remember one of the things he did at lunch was he sat down and he's like hey guys want me to make it snow and we're like what and right over all of our lunches he just went like this and shook out his hair and dandruff went everywhere all over all of our food so no one ate that day because we were all just pretty disgusted by that because yeah what do you what do you do to that one um and then in high school you could kind of sit wherever you wanted in the lunchroom how did your school day end um so the school day ended when usually the bell rang in elementary school and in middle school you had to wait the whole like all the way through and then your parents you don't want to pick you up um but in high school if you had good grades you had the opportunity for a ninth hour and to leave during that like study hall ninth hour um and usually for me since i was a teacher kid until i had my own car i couldn't leave during ninth hour i usually had to just stay or i'd go down to my mom's um also like i said since i was kind of awkward middle schooler um a lot of times I would, you couldn't leave a classroom unless you had a teacher signature to leave. So I would forge my mom's uh, signature on my planner and say, oh, my mom scheduled me to go down to her office to help her clean during ninth hour, like in middle school and stuff. And they would just be like, oh, of course, because, you know, like I said, I was a good kid. So they would just let me go do it. And that I only really did that if my mom hadn't signed my planner for like the week out, you know, but Typically, she would just sign it out because she's like, yeah, you don't have to sit and be bored at ninth hour. You can come and hang out with me. I don't really care. Um, so, yeah, so that's usually what I would do um, during those times. Um, yeah. What was expected of you after you got home? When I got home, typically, you know, you always had to do homework first, then you could play. Um, and also, too, homework included, um, like, band work, too. So a lot of times, like I said, if I got home, I'd have to do my 30 minutes of piano, 30 minutes of trombone, 
um, and then I could go play, although sometimes I wasn't always perfect with that, especially as I got older, I kind of stopped with trombone and band practicing like at all, because I was pretty good, so I knew I could get away with uh, not practicing so much, so yeah. <laughs> How did technology affect your homework? So technology really changed the way homework was done. So I remember in like elementary school, you know, they still were wanting us, you know, to go to the encyclopedia and look up your sources in a book and like nothing was trusted online at that point. Like you could use maybe one online source, but the teachers were like, we still don't want you using it because the internet, you can't trust the internet. And even if you use like the New York Times, it'd still be like, I don't know, you got that from the internet. Someone could have made a fake New York Times website and you know, or whatever. So they were pretty strict on the internet when you were like a little kid. Um, and of course, you know, you always got the talk as a little kid of like, oh, you know, don't share your information online to strangers, that sort of thing. You know, pretty basic internet safety stuff. Um, but then when I got into like fifth grade, that's when they started to introduce like PowerPoint and like using a flash drive to save your PowerPoint. Um, and then also like writing your papers online through Microsoft Word. Um, and then when I went to Newman, Newman used Google Docs, so we didn't use the PowerPoint, like, Microsoft products at all. Like I said, it was more of an Apple school, so they used Google Docs a lot more, so we would use that, and, um, it was throughout that time period that, like, using technology was a lot more acceptable. Um, once we were in high school, that's when the school introduced using, um, this application called um, Google Classroom and so in Google Classroom your teachers could post assignments and then that's how you'd know like where to find them and then you'd submit them through Google Classroom and um, one of the things I always really hated and that some teachers even do this to this day is the teacher would wait until like late at night to post the assignment or like that was due the next day in class and so you would have to bring home a lot of your books on off chance that your teacher would drop an assignment, you know, like 5 p.m. and be like, oh, surprise, you have this. But, like, most teachers were pretty considerate. There's only, like, one or two that would do that, but it would be really aggravating when they would because if you didn't bring your books home, then you'd have to, like, rush to school the next morning so you could get your homework done in time before class and so you wouldn't get, like, an F or something. What extracurricular activities did you participate in? So, when I was younger, and like in elementary school I always had to be in a sport um during the summertime typically like one I had to pick one sport and do it and I could choose whichever one I wanted so I did pretty much every sport I could like once a year because I really didn't like sports so I always would try to find a new one and say oh this will be the sport I'm good at it was not so like I did like basketball sometimes I did horseback riding I did um tennis, I did, um, you know, like a lot of different other little things. Um, the one thing I really loved as a kid was swimming, and so after I passed through all my swimming lessons, then when I was um, in third grade, I joined the swim team, and so during, from third grade to fifth grade, I was in swim team, and so every summer and all through the year, I would have swim team practice, and I was pretty good at it too, like I would get um, ribbons and stuff um, but yeah a lot of those other things didn't the other sports never really stuck the way swim team did but then once I got into sixth grade um, in sixth grade I did I tried to do a travel basketball team because I was like oh I did it once as a kid maybe I'd like it again I am not a basketball player even though I'm tall that is not a forte that is not something I'm good at and I remember I bumped into someone while we were on the court and I literally stopped and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to bump into you. And the lady like looked at me like, um, this is basketball, that's kind of the point, you know? But yeah, I was not aggressive, so sports were not really my thing. Um, and then in seventh grade, I did volleyball and I wasn't like a huge fan of actually playing, but I still liked the sport like in theory. So in eighth grade, I had actually broken my toe. And it kind of gave me an excuse to not play because I always wanted to, you know, participate for the social aspect, but like not for the actual sport aspect. 
So I was able to then be like their manager and I was able to like take stats and do their numbers, which I continued all the way all four years through high school and I really, I loved that. I loved feeling like I was part of a team even though I didn't actually have to do like the workouts and stuff. Um, and then also in seventh and eighth grade I did track, which I know I said I wasn't much of a runner. I was not, but again, I did it for the social aspect. And also in seventh grade, from seventh grade to freshman year, I was in Taekwondo and I got to be a green belt. So that was really fun. And I also, um, like I said, I was in band. I then went in high school, I did like jazz band too. And I um, did writing club and I participated in like National Honor Society. And then also in high school, I actually took classes at the local community college a lot of times during the nights or online and I ended up actually graduating from the community college at the same time that I graduated from high school because of that. So in a way taking um, those classes kind of was my extracurricular. So what was this consolidation like for your school? Yeah so when we consolidated from fourth grade to fifth grade I remember I really did not like that because I loved my elementary school. It was just like a perfect kind of place. I felt like everyone knew each other, everyone was pretty friendly, and also the thing is is that I really honestly truly believed, you know, like when they said like, oh we're all friends in like elementary school, like I believed that. I believed we all were friends. And so to me it was like, oh I'm being taken away from all my friends. And because there was a lot of that identity in what school you went to, I felt like it was hard because like, oh, we're now no longer Jefferson kids, you know, the Jefferson kids that walk down the street, like with our song and everything, like, oh, now we're just Lincoln kids. And also too, there was a lot of special events that they had planned for fifth graders that I no longer would get to participate in. Like um, the fifth graders would always read this book called The Chocolate Touch, and then you'd get like a bunch of chocolate as you read the book. Um, they also would get to carve pumpkins in school. Um, like I said, they did like the news caption. They just kind of do like a lot more fun things that I had really like spent my whole elementary school life looking forward to. And then it felt like it got all taken away because once we went to Lincoln, none of those other teachers had those traditions so we just didn't get them, you know? And also it was really hard for me because when I was at Lincoln, um, the way that the system worked, because there were so many kids, was the school was broken up into three like families so you were either in family one family two or family three and literally every jefferson kid but me basically was in family two i was in family three and in each family there were two classrooms and i was in like classroom one and i had one other friend who was in classroom two but you never saw each other in those other classrooms so i was all alone in this class and the class I was in too, um, it was full of kids A I had never met before and B there was a lot of like behavioral issues, issues in that class like over half the class would leave at the start of every morning because they had such intense behavioral issues that they could not sit through class. And I know in the past I had experienced some of that because when I was like in second grade there was a boy who was from the um, like uh, what is it called like Four Oaks you know um, place that they had started to integrate him into our school but they ended up having to pull him out because he was like throwing things at people uh, and whatnot and becoming violent but I it just was kind of shocking for me for that reason and also too a lot of the kids that was that were in that class um, they were a from a totally different school than me and b most of them were from a very different socioeconomic class than I was. Like at Jefferson, most of the kids, like I was like the poorest kid. You know, like most of my, all my friends were either my socioeconomic status or higher. You know, like either everyone's parents were like middle class or higher. So this was like the first time I was in a class full of kids who were not middle class at all. And it was a big shock to me because I remember we were doing like a family day and this one girl came up to me and she was kind of like a mean girl but so I kind of expected her to say something mean to me 
but she like looked down at my picture and it was, I just brought like a family picture and she just goes, wow, you really have a perfect family, huh? And I was like, well, what do you mean? No, I don't. Like my siblings are so annoying. They're not perfect. And she goes, well, yeah, you do. Your whole family's together there. Like your mom and dad aren't divorced. None of your siblings are in prison. Your family's perfect. And I just remember that like just shocked me because it's like, wow, I guess. I guess you're right, you know? Um, but yeah, no, that class definitely had some problem people in it, though. Like, yeah. <laughs> and so it was a big shock to me. That Specifically that mean girl, too, that I just talked about. I remember one of the girls that I had kind of befriended in that class. It was a big trend back then to put glitter in your hair. And this girl, the mean girl, you know... She walked up to my friend and was like, oh, hey, I have some hair glitter you could put in your hair. And my friend was like, oh, my gosh, thank you. And she put it in her hair, like, right before we had, like, recess. And it was glue. It was glue with glitter in it. That's what she had given her as the hair glitter. And so my friend had to spend the rest of the day with, like, one of the, um, like, teachers that was, like, around or, like, a, an aide or something washing out her hair in the bathroom because yeah the main girl had tricked her into putting glue in her hair so it was it was definitely a lot different from Jefferson so how did you feel about all of that at the end of the day like I said I really didn't like it um I would cry a lot about going to school um I called it stinking Lincoln because I really did not like it um like I said I had befriended a few people in the class but for the most part, that class that I was in was just really not some place that I felt comfortable in. I remember too, like, there was this one guy who was, like, really creepy, and he would never, like, he, you know, like, he would never look a girl in her eyes. He would always stare at her chest, and it was just really creepy, and I always hated that. And, you know, like, among other things, it just was not a place I felt comfortable in. Also at Lincoln, too. They had over three code reds, which a code red is like they shut down the school. And I know at least one of the times was because someone had stripped completely naked and ran around the school. Completely, completely naked. So that was a very odd, just a really odd experience. And I remember too, my mom had even asked the school, like, can we please put my daughter with her friends because she's kind of miserable. She doesn't know anyone. She doesn't really connect with anyone. And they told my mom no. So that was pretty tough for me so then that's why I switched over to um to Lincoln or to not not from Lincoln to Newman okay. uh, do you remember any major local national world events that occurred during your school years yes so um technically I guess I did live through um 9-11 technically when I was one but I don't remember it but I do remember it being brought up like all the time as a kid and I remember like the Middle East wars and I remember it really shocked me um because you know when you're a little kid growing up you're always told like oh America's the greatest country in the whole wide world America can do no wrong all this and I remember I was talking to this boy in one of my class like that was a neighbor boy and we were playing like GI Joes and I was like, oh, like, he was like, he, he was playing the bad guy, and he was like, well, these bad guys are good, and I was like, well, no, they're bad, they're bad guys, duh, you know, like, like, Saddam Hussein, or, um, like, Bin Laden, I was like, Bin Laden's bad, he's bad, you know, and my friend, he was like a few years older, and he goes, well, did you ever think that maybe the bad guys think we're the bad guys? And I remember that just, like, blew my mind as a little kid, because I was like, well, how could the bad guys not know that they're bad, you know? Um, but then it, like, kind of dawned on me that it's like, oh, like, other places might not see the U.S. as, like, this great, amazing place, you know? And so that was, like, kind of a big eye-opener for me. Um, I also remember, though, you know, because, like, obviously, like, terrorism was, like, a big thing that people were concerned about um, being a thing to... Uh, was when Bin Laden was actually killed um, in May. I remember waking up and all of the radio stations were playing Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead. 
And I remember my mom was like really happy and she's like, oh, like they killed Bin Laden, SEAL Team 6 killed Bin Laden. And I was like, oh my gosh. And everyone was like really celebrating. But like my mom also said though, like even though he's dead, like there's gonna be another terrorist group that comes up because like, you know, being like a 10 year old, you're like, oh, the, they killed the main bad guy, the leader. That means that it's all gone now, you know? And it's, it's not, it, obviously, you know, there's other terrorist groups that grew up out of that. but. I remember just all the happiness that everyone felt because we were all like running around school being like, did you hear that like Bin Laden's dead? Like he's dead, yay, we win, you know? Um, and that was just like kind of, it felt like kind of freeing because like the whole time, you know, you always like heard about terrorism and it always seemed kind of scary. So it felt like really happy to be like, oh, now we don't maybe have to worry about that. But of course we did, but you know. Um, and also I remember like in 2008 there was a big flood in Iowa um the 08 flood and I don't remember it really impacting me per se because like we had like some flooding and like we for a week we couldn't shower because the water got turned off so we had to go out to the country to like go to a friend's house to shower and I remember really not liking that but like my house was fine whereas like there was a kid in my school um his name is Danny and he told me that his whole house got like swept away and that he was gonna have to totally get a new house and everything and I was like that's crazy I can't even imagine that you know so that was a big thing and like and I know at that time too in 2008 um that was when like the recession started to happen but like I didn't really feel it but I remember grown-ups talking about it and being like oh the recession blah 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 and I was like okay and I also remember too of course in 08 that was when Obama was elected and I was really happy about that because it, I thought it was really cool that we'd have our first black president and he just seemed like really cool like he played basketball and he'd actually come to my town to play basketball too and so I just thought he was like a cool guy whereas like his opponent like Mitt Romney just didn't seem cool but of course you know you're eight so like yeah that's what you're basing your political views on is like whether or not they're cool or not um, but yeah, I just thought Obama was really nice, and I remember because my town's pretty like Republican. They there was this big poster up um, over by the Taco John's, and every time you pass it, it was like it was sponsored by like the Tea Party, and it was like what what's Obama's birth certificate say? And like I didn't really understand it because like you know your kid, you don't really get why they're freaking out over Obama's birth certificate. You're like. He's an American. He's from Hawaii. He's cool. But I just remember that being like a big thing and like and I remember I guess like sort of starting to see that like rise of more like conservativeness like I remember people that would be like really like oh why don't they say the Pledge of Allegiance in school and whatever like especially old people would ask me that and I'd be like we say the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know what you're talking about. We say it. You know just being really confused. Um. But yeah, I remember that, and then I also remember um, Trump's election in 2016, and that was pretty crazy, because again, pretty conservative area, and I remember um, in, I was in government class at the time, and my group for government, our job was to make like a campaign for like Hillary Clinton, and another group had Trump, and another group had like Kanye, it was like, you know, you could pick your politician, and my group chose Hillary. And I remember we like posted all of our posters up outside of the classroom and a bunch of people vandalized ours and wrote like lock her up on it and stuff like that, which was dumb. But yeah, and I remember like when Trump got elected too, like it was just really weird. Like I was so convinced that Hillary was going to win and it was just like, oh, you know, like that's just doesn't seem possible, but it was. And... Oh, also, too, I forgot about this. When I was in sixth grade, um, my first year at New England Catholic, uh, there was an incident of a bomb threat. <laughs> and that day was our, um, like, party day because we had earned, like, a party. I don't remember why, but we did. So the whole school was, like, kind of just having, like, a relaxed day before Christmas, or, like, it was a Christmas break. It was, I don't even remember, but it was, like, kind of, like, in the winter. And I remember we were doing this big dance competition for choir of who could do the dance from the We Just Dance, the like rah rah Rasputin 
you know, like that song. Um, and I remember we were like halfway through the competition when the police officers showed up and they're like, everyone, go down to the elementary school gym right now. And we all like walked down there. And I remember thinking to myself, and he was saying to my friends, like, if there's a bomb, why are they walking us through the whole school? Because we could set the bomb off. But we all went down there and that was like when they first got iPads too. So they handed out everyone iPads for like a group of kids. Each group would get like an iPad. And um, for the elementary schoolers, they could watch, I think it was like, it wasn't Frozen, that wasn't out yet, but like some Disney movie was on like Up or something. And we, the rest of us like sat around iPads and because the school had taken off the app store, because they only wanted to have educational games on, but they hadn't put the educational games on it yet. The only thing we could do on there was use the camera. So like I remember sitting in the elementary school gym waiting for like the cops to go through to find the bomb just playing with the uh the camera but the funny thing was was that there wasn't actually a bomb because so what happened was this, these two criminals called up 911 and they're like we're gonna you know bomb Newman Catholic um elementary school high school whatever you need to get over there so all the entire Mason City police force went to Newman now the police station is right next to a bank and that's what the robbers, that's what those guys did is they called in a fake bomb threat so everyone left so then when they robbed the bank the cops weren't there they were all the way across town at Newman <laughs> and so then they almost got away with it too they I think they the only way that they were found was because of like an old footage of them calling from the payphone was picked up that was it otherwise they would not have found out who those people were because yeah, literally the entire force was at Newman looking for a fake bomb. Um, it was pretty funny. Um, yeah. I'd say that's about it. Oh yeah, and then technically in college, you know, 2020 pandemic um, happened. It was not fun. Like the first couple weeks were really fun. Don't get me wrong. It was like, oh yeah, extended break. I get to make a bunch of cookies and hang out with my family. But then those couple weeks turned into months and it was a real sad time to just be at home and you know not know what would happen next and like thankfully like my boyfriend um and I were like long term like but also like we were long distance at the time and thankfully we never actually had COVID or anything but we only ever spent time with each other we never went to spend time with other people you know like my like we pretty much uh, besides staying at home, that was the only person we'd ever go meet, and if we even, like, had, like, a cough, it was like, nope, can't see you that week. So it was a little stressful not knowing what's going to happen next, um, with COVID. And obviously wearing masks, and unvaccinated, and with the booster. So, yeah, that was pretty, that was good, but, yeah. Is there anything else that you think is worth talking about relating to your school time? Um, not a ton. Oh, I guess there was one other thing that happened at my school, and this was in middle school, and this boy, um, like I said, it was the gross boy that did the let it snow thing in lunch, but he, um, his mom was very wealthy, and his dad had passed away, and because his mother was very wealthy, she paid for a lot of things at the school, and also... Uh, because of that, if he did stuff that he should have gotten in trouble for, he didn't really get as much trouble for because she would, like, pay for stuff. Um, like, for example, he had broken a door, he had broken a chair. Um, that school actually had asbestos in the ceilings, and he was known to take off his shoe and try and hit the asbestos down on people because, like, there was a sealant on the asbestos, but um, he would, like, try and scrape it off and, like, get the asbestos on people, you know, because, like, that causes cancer and stuff. And he was also, he would always, like, make threats specifically to other boys. Like, he would, like, and they'd be, like, really specific and violent threats, too, because I had some friends that were guys who told me about it, like, that he would, like, follow him after class and be like, I'm gonna follow you down a dark alley and gut you like a fish with this knife, you know, like, or with a knife I have at home. Because, you know, he couldn't bring weapons to school. Well, anyways, this guy, um, he wasn't the smartest little uh, crayon in the box, we'll just say. And one day, he decided to make a fun little at-home video on YouTube 
about how he was going to shoot up the school and he was going to shoot us all with the guns that his dad had given him, you know, when the dad, when his dad passed away. And he showed out, like, specific guns and who he was going to kill with which gun, and he posted it on YouTube. But, when he posted it on YouTube, he used his Newman Catholic account to do so. So, they were able to very quickly link that to, you know, like, some person in California, I guess, found it. Like, it was like a watch group for that sort of thing. And they found it online and they told the, our principal about it, like, the night it happened. And by the next day, that kid was expelled from school and we were not allowed to talk about it. Um, but some people had seen the video. I had not and I didn't, I didn't know, like, if I was ever named in it or anything. I don't think I'd want to know if I was named. Probably was. But, yeah, he um, did threaten to, to kill us all. And... Yeah, so then he got kicked out, and he had to go to public school, which we were told not to tell the public schoolers about, because otherwise we'd get in trouble, because, like, he needed a fresh start or something. But I 100% texted my friends the moment that we got out of that little meeting, because I was like, yeah, I want my friends to know about the potential sh school shooter moment. <laughs> so yeah, so that was my school experience. Okay. Yep.